Now we'll move on to item seven, study session, please. Item 7A, report on regional housing needs allocation, RHNA, for the 2023 to 2031 housing element update. And we'll turn it over to city manager. Okay, uh, let us share the screen. Mayor, uh, council members, and members of the, of the public, uh, now we have a regional housing needs allocation presentation that will be delivered by Pamela Wu, our Community and Economic Development Director. And so uh, she will give a presentation, but uh, both her and I are available for comments and uh, questions. Pamela? Thank you, City Manager. Good evening, Honorable Mayors and city uh, members of the City Council. My name is Pamela Wu, and I am the City's Econ uh, Community and Economic Development Director. With me tonight, I have Lisa Costa Sanders from Good City Company, who has been assisting the city in preparing our housing element, as well as Josh Abrams from 21 Elements and Michael Smith, City, city Senior Planner. We'll be providing the Council an update of the Regional Housing Needs Allocation, RENA, status as well as the housing element process. Tonight's agenda will start with the background on the housing elements and why we need to prepare them, what do we do, how does it work, and how does it relate to our current RENA cycle that we're in right now. I'll provide a snapshot of where we are with RENA 5 and move on to the next RENA uh, projection. I will also briefly update the council on the action that was taken by the ABAC board last week. And I'll explain how the proposed RENA 6 allocation ties to the housing element update, identifying the next steps, and I'll um, close the, uh, tonight's presentation by answering any questions that council may have. On the background. Since 1929, as mandated by state law, each city and the county are required to accommodate their fair share of regional housing needs through a housing element update. The California Department of Housing Community Development, HCD, determines the overall housing needs and the fair share for each region. In turn, the Association of Bay Area Governments, ABAG, allocates the Bay Area region housing needs to each county and the cities within each county. The renowned assignment for each jurisdiction is comprised of the four following income category. Very low, which is 50% of AMI, low, 80% of AMI, moderate income, 120% AMI, and also above moderate income. The AMI represents the average median income for the San Mateo County. When jurisdictions receive their final RENA allocation, the implementation is strategized through the housing element process to reconcile these housing production numbers within the housing cycle, within the RENA cycle. It's worth noting that the current housing element is merely a planning document that sets forth policy and strategy for the city to achieve its RENA allocation. However, it's up to the private developer to make the final development choices. We're currently within the 2015 to 2023 housing element, the RENA 5 cycle, which requires 1,155 housing units to be completed by the end of 2022. By the end of 2019, City of San Bruno has completed a total of 168 units. By the next housing element, which is RENA number 6, this will cover the period of 2023 to 2031, and the city is required to have its housing elements certified by HCD on or before January of 2023. Um, staff wants to note, uh, highlight a few state legislation updates that were passed in 2017 and 2018 in response to the state's uh, declaration of a housing crisis. This significantly strengthened the city's uh, certification criteria and anticipate a significant increase in the next arena cycle allocation. As of today, City of San Bruno is behind on meeting its obligation, but we remain to be in compliance with our current housing elements. 
you may want to ask why is that important? The city wants to be um, in compliance with housing elements so that we're eligible for qualifying state and regional funding opportunities to promote more housing, transportation, or parks initiatives. So where are we in the Luna 5 progress? Um, as you can see on the chart, uh, we have produced <laughs> very little, which is zero, of the very low income units, about a, um, a total of 67 low income, 47 moderate income units, um, 54 of above moderate income, which comes to a total of 168 units as of by December of 2019. And this is the same chart that staff has brought to council each April as part of the annual progress report that's uh, forwarded to HCD for review. The good news is we have made some progress in 2020. If you remember, City Council approved a large uh, residential project at Mills Park Center, which comprised a total of 427 units in August. Uh, we have included additional um, single family constructions at Skyline, approved additional ADUs. We're also anticipating additional residential projects to be approved um, through its entitlement in 2021. This includes the Glenview Terrace development of 29 units, 22 condo units of 271 El Camino, in addition to many ADUs and single family residents. The total RENA obligation numbers that the City of San Bruno is required to complete includes both building permits that are issued as well as uh, buildings that have finished construction that received a final occupancy. Moving on to RENA 6 allocation, um, allocation, the planning effort for RENA 6 has been underway for some time, but the official numbers were coming out as a draft release starting uh, last summer. In June 2020, HCD allocated about 441,000 housing unit for the entire Bay Area. This is a significant increase of approximately 135% from RENA 5. It is also worth noting that we didn't get the, the biggest increase. The Southern California received a 225% increase. By October 2020, AVAC allocated about 49,000 housing units to San Mateo County and assigned 2,130 units to the city of San Bruno. Between October and December, AVAC decreased the overall housing units for the county to 47,321, approximately 1,000 units less. However, added 1,062 units, a 50% increase to City of San Bruno for a grand total of 3,192 units. On January 21st, last Thursday, EVAC approved a draft methodology and the final draft of the Rena 6 allocation. With that said, City of San Bruno is required to complete its housing element complying with the Rena 6 allocation of 3,192 units. Um, and certified by January 2023. This chart gives you a snapshot of how many units is allocated within the Arena 6. Of the 3,992, 192 units, um, AUBAC anticipated about 721 units for very low income, 415 for low income, 573 for moderate and 1,483 units for above moderate income. Some of the major factors that affected the changes between October and December is that there were adjustments made in the final draft of the plate uh, of the plan area 2050, which affected the methodology and the final allocation for Rena 6. This also shifted the area where jobs is, pro, uh, is projected and also the trends of rich communities. The AVAC staff also explained that there are policies regarding public lands, aging shopping malls, office park, pipeline project, etc. This next chart shows you a comparison of where we are right now in Arena 5, where we will be in Arena 6 the changes, the delta between the two. Um, so I put together the changes in units as well as the changes in percentage. 
you can see that in each category, we're, increase, we're experiencing an increase. And in total, we're experiencing an approximately 136% of increase in total numbers and a 344% of above moderate income units. Where are we today? Is that the December 18 final draft allocation was released by ABAD. Um, staff did not receive a notification of the final draft until January 13. A few days after staff was made aware of the new allocation, we immediately contacted ABAC staff to understand the reason for a dramatic 50% increase. The day after, city manager and city mayor for the re reconsideration and objection letter to ABAC asking for the reason of an additional 1,062 units um, and see if we can ask for a reconsideration of the numbers. Unfortunately, despite our protest, ABAC will approve the proposed methodology and the final draft. That will leave City of San Bruno with a total of 3,192 units. How does that tie into the housing element of the process? Assuming the numbers becomes our final allocation. Staff has been uh, collaborating with 21 elements to update the housing element. We have done site needs assessment. We're identifying new future sites that can um, satisfy the new numbers. And we will also be looking at rezoning additional sites, re uh, refining the site inventory, and to prepare goals and policy for the new housing element. This is a two-year planning effort with a target completion date by the end of December 2022, so that HCE can certify our housing element in January of 2023. What are the next steps for us? The next steps uh, for the RENA 6 process, as you can see on um, the chart on the left, it shows that we're somewhere in the middle of this chart in January 2021, where ABAC has approved the final draft of the methodology and the RENA allocation. The next step is for ABAC staff to forward their recommendation to HCD to approve uh, the final allocation. If HCD approves the final allocation, the city will have a chance to make an appeal to the final allocation during summer of this year before the final allocation is finalized by December of this year. What does that mean for us, the next steps for City of San Bruno? We will continue to work on additional projects. We will also formally file an appeal to HCD by summer if our final allocation does not get changed. City Council should continue to review and approve pipeline projects so that the additional units can count towards Rena 5 allocation. And we will also continue to collaborate with 21 elements to prepare the housing element update um, along um, with other cities anticipating the Rena 6 allocation to be finalized later this year. This is all with the goal to have the housing element certified by January 2023. That concludes my presentation, and I'm here um, with the team to answer any of your questions. Well, and first, um, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, to uh, the director and and uh, let us all uh, uh, congratulate you on your appointment to uh, the being the director and uh, this wasn't uh, the welcome gift we were hoping to give you but um, uh, we appreciate that you uh, uh, have been on top of this so thank you and what I'd like to do is uh, first go to our my colleagues and see if we've got uh, any questions and then we certainly um, we'll see if anyone from the public does as well. Any council comments or questions? Uh, yes, Council Member Hamilton. So, uh, first of all, I want to make sure um, for for folks that are that are listening, and, and you, uh, I would want um, uh, you, Mr. Mayor and, and City Manager, to make sure I'm make, make sure I'm accurate here. When we're when we're t talking about um, uh, you, know, um, you know, filing appeals for these numbers, that doesn't mean that San Bruno is not committed to doing our part for, for housing. It has to do with 
the fact that the allocation for the Bay Area was made and the distribution of that allocation among the city, the, among the various cities, didn't seem quite fair. Um, where you know some some of the cities, their allocation actually went down, and ours went up, you know, very very significantly. Because um, I think it, I want to m- make sure that we send the right message to our to our residents that we are committed to adding housing and and um, and doing our part for, to to solve the housing crisis. That's my that's my first comment. I want I just, I just want to pause and make sure that that I'm not out of line with that with that comment or putting words in anyone's mouth. No, I, th- I thank you for the question. I'm going to give that to the city manager and or director, but please, sure. thank you for the question. Council Member Hamilton, uh, thank you for pointing that out. You're absolutely right. And the argument that we made to AMAG in the letter that the mayor and I signed and in the comments that both myself and um, uh, uh, Pamela, Director Pamela Wu made were at a high level saying, San Bruno is not a NIMBY community. San Bruno, San Bruno actually upzoned a significant portion of our community through the transit corridors, recognizing that there is a regional housing need and going through a elaborate and intensive community input process to say, we know we need to build more housing. Where should that housing be built? It's also worth noting that this requirement is a planning requirement. We don't build housing for the most part. We, we provide the available zoning for private partners to come in and build housing. And then nonprofits when you, when you talk about affordable housing. Uh, we also made the, the point that when the October numbers came out, San Bruno saw a 85% jump in the prior Rena 5 allocation. We did not raise our hand to protest then. Again, based on the director's presentation, the entire Bay Area allocation went up by 135%. We, we understood that to be our fair share of the regional's housing need. Unfortunately, what happened in the final analysis is ABAC applied what they call to be an equity analysis. And that information was released on December 18th without a lot of fanfare. And so there were a number of cities, not just San Bruno, at this meeting last Thursday saying, wait, 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 you are moving too fast. The cities only received these allocations. Um, only, many of them only received word of how intensive the allocations were within the last two weeks. And ABAG released them giving only roughly a month's notice seven days before the, the, the end of the year holiday season begun. And in that final analysis, what they did is they shifted additional housing to transit rich communities and communities that had sites that they thought could develop additional housing. In particular, what we were able to find out in just the literally right before that meeting is that they had flagged a number of our sites that are within the control of the airport land use authority that has both height restrictions and sound restrictions as places where housing can be built. We disagree with the methodology. A number of cities disagree with the methodology. And in fact, our number went up 50% from the October to the December numbers. And right now we're sitting at a 176% increase from the prior arena five numbers. To say that we're sort of outraged is an understatement. Um, uh, and we do intend to appeal this decision. And lastly, it's, Im- it's important to just come back to the point that we have zones for housing. Yes, as a community, we have not met the arena five numbers. But in fact, what the data shows is even though uh, Mills Park took a year to come back. This council has actually approved every housing project that has come before it. And so there are, of course, a regional housing shortage. But unfortunately, what this last equity model did, it actually transitioned units away from some of the, our neighboring communities that are actually more responsible for the job, for the current job housing imbalance than we are, because they've had more development over the last 10 to 20 years than we have. But the ABAG model 
looked at cities that have high transit. And you look at San Bruno, 101, 280, 380, BART, Caltrain, high capacity bus route by SFO. And the nature of where we located had us seen a, a more significant increase than other cities. And by percentage, um, I'm probably rattling off uh, too many stats, but the increase, it, the increase represents 20% of our current housing stock. That's the second highest increase that ABAG applied for every city in the Bay Area. The only next highest was, um, I, wanna, I think it was Hillsburg, and that's only because they're so small. They only had 250 additional units. We had the single largest. Now, other cities like San Francisco had more units applied, but percentage-wise, we're the second highest. Um, and, and, and we think fundamentally there's some challenges with the model that ABAG applied. I know I went off. Uh, and a tangent, but I, I want to I want to let the council and the community know that we're definitely tracking tracking this, and we we definitely intend uh, intend to appeal. And we're not saying we're anti housing; we're saying the methodology is flawed. Thank you. And actually, that leads directly into my into my other question, which is the the you know what was just approved. There it was they're calling it the final draft, and but then the actual approval doesn't take place until. Um, spring, and then we do the, and then we the appeal the appeal process got, happens in summer. Is there a is there a chance the numbers will shift again before that? I, I the, the word draft sends a little chill that they'll say oh oh and by the way here's another thirty percent. That's an interesting question. So the ABAG board, the ABAG executive board approved these numbers last Thursday, and so unless they change that decision to make the impact more drastic. Um, uh, that's the only way that the, the model can change. Typically what happens in these cycles is once a draft is approved, there's then the appeal process, and that is the way that communities articulate why okay. they believe that their allocation does not represent a fair share. Now, one of the challenges with an appeal is that ABAG is allocating numbers that came from the state. And so if we are successful in an appeal, that in general means those housing units have to go somewhere else. And so it is an uphill battle, um, but, but we, we, we intend to forthrightly go about it. Okay, thank you. So it's, uh, it's unlikely that, it'll, that it's gonna get worse, but it's bad enough as it is. Yes. Okay. Thank you, I appreciate your responses to my questions, thank you. Here, council member. You know, we do have a member. Uh, let's go to the public just because somebody has been waiting and in case they need to, we have a few people and in case they need to uh, make their comments known and then uh, wish to uh, maybe uh, need to leave the meeting. So um, we have several. So why, uh, city clerk, if we can open it up. Uh, yes, we have Paul Wapinski. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you whenever you're ready. Right. I find it amazing that the government continues to follow the NHNA uh, plan that's completely overcome by events and out of date. You know, the, the government's unable to be flexible. Someone needs to tell these people that the emperor have no, has no clothes. And uh, just a quick question, I know you can't answer it now, but what legal authority does this board have? As a third order effect of the coronavirus, our housing and transportation problems seem to be solved. Uh, all these companies and people are, are moving out of the Bay Area. There was a, a great quote today on the SF gate by John Gardner, the founder and CEO of Kickoff, who said, what else can God and the world and government come up with to make this place less livable? You know, why are people leaving here is because of the commute, the pollution, crime, uh, COVID, and they don't have to work here anymore. They can work from Lake Tahoe. They can work from uh, Eli, Nevada. It doesn't matter, they can all work from home. As far as housing goes, I did a quick survey. If you look at the Aperture and Avalon apartment buildings, they're all looking for renters. Uh, if you search for apartments in San Bruno, there's numerous available. Why, why are they full or why aren't they full if we have a crisis? You know, San Francisco's had a 35% decrease in rent rates because people are moving away as fast as they can. You know, and after the COVID crisis is over, I, you know, I doubt people are going to want to return to living in close proximity to each other. You know, having to bring their own shopping bags and take pre uh, public transportation. 
you know, nobody's going to want to commute from here to San Francisco because everybody's leaving. Um, BART director Liz Ames recently said, you know, I don't see how BART survives. Um, the commercial real estate uh, market is, is pretty bad right now. You know, you can't, it's no longer lucrative with all the requirements and, uh, uh, you know, you can't force a developer to build and that's why this plan is going to fail. You know, I'm surprised that the Mills Park project is still going forward because if I was that guy, I'd take my money and run. I, I, I just don't think his financial projections are going to be even close to what he thought they would be. <clears throat> you know, and, and as a side note, what about the Bay Hill YouTube campus? Are they still planning on uh, continuing their project? You know, if all their employees are working for home or from home. Um, you know, we just talked about reducing uh, our water uh, requirements. Now we want to build 3,000 units. You know, how do you square that? You know, what about the green plan everybody talks about and reducing our carbon footprint and we're going to add 3,000 more units? Uh, you know, what if we don't have any open space left? What are they going to do with uh, this plan um, it, for the cities that don't have space to build? You know, and then the last thing I got is, you know, what's the cost to the city in terms of infrastructure, police and fire equipment? You know, we're going to buy two fire trucks. How many more do we need? How many more fire uh, or police officers and uh, police cars are we going to need? City services required, uh, increase in uh, uh, city services, et cetera. So, you know, is the city going to blindly follow the path of this insanity or, or, you know, do we not just live through 2020? Centralized planning doesn't work and somebody needs to push back and say this is stupid. Thank you. I'm sorry I went over. Okay. Thank you for your comments. Next, please. And, uh... Jules Bruyere, one moment while I bring you over. Hello. Um, you guys can hear me? Yes, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Um, so although we are in the middle of a recession uh, and, and there are some empty units, this these housing prices continue to be sticky. And uh, while people are trying to pay similar rents, uh, incomes are going way down. So this, this housing crisis has deepened. Um, I'm an essential worker, a, a school teacher for South City Schools. Uh, I have to pay 4,200 monthly for a three and a half bedroom single family home. And there was no rent decrease uh, over 2020. Uh, 10 years ago, it was all at an already ridiculous price of 2,800 monthly, uh, but we're used to overpaying for rent. This is impossible for me to do myself with my teacher's salary. I have to split my home with other professionals. That leaves me with no space to raise a family and I chose temporarily to forego the family. People, essential workers who are too young and too average income to buy early, essential workers like myself have to choose between uh, being a, a essential workers here and raising those families. Uh, what can we do to make housing prices fairer for essential workers? Our arena numbers are higher because we didn't build nearly enough units. As noted in the report, only 168 of the 1,100 plus units were built in the last five years, uh, and the 427 units from the Mills Park will only bring us to half of what's asked for in San Bruno. The 3,200 units allocated in this new projection are our backlog to make a housing affordable again here. Uh, some sections of the city are more limited, though not per totally precluded from development uh, by the airport land use uh, compatibility plan. But that doesn't mean that our city can't grow this much or more if effort is given to meet the housing allocation rather than contest it. Given how severe the housing crisis is for all but the richest residents and workers, I welcome this more ambitious housing allocation. And you should too. Let us be a leader in housing by showing our neighbors how intelligent housing growth is done. If we do so, we'll be have met a better part of our quota for this coming allocation. We'll be in much stronger position to demand our neighboring cities to step up their housing development efforts. If we seek a fair housing allocation, let's rescue San Bruno's affordable housing credibility by actually building affordable and market raised housing that we promised to but remain behind schedule on. It's ridiculous that we haven't built any 
low income housing units. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next speaker, please. Alexander Melendrez. Hello, San Bruno City Council uh, and city staff. Alex Melendrez, San Bruno residents. Uh, I'm speaking on my own behalf, but I do work at a nonprofit affordable housing organization. Uh, so that does give me some sort of insight and understanding on the complex nuances of housing policy, regional planning, existing constraints and opportunities, et cetera. It's really hard to follow up after Jules's comments. That was that was my I'm really proud of my fellow residents uh, uh, strong comments. I agree with everything he just said. I'm not really sure we're just build off of that. Um, we're still 87 percent behind on our existing arena numbers. We don't have to re hash that, but we can look forward into our continuing uh, expansive growth for YouTube uh, and how we're seeking other opportun opportunities to grow. Um, I really think we should drop our existing appeal. I don't think that this existing allocation is is crazy to think about. When you hear me out, when you're thinking 3,129, it's not a lot when you frame it uh, in the number, uh, when you frame it less as a number and more as an individual people, more living space, faces, names, and families. Uh, as Jules pointed out prior, we have a massive deficit to make up for, even beyond what our current, uh, you know, Rena cycle allocates for. Um, and there's considerable argument that's stating that even in the Rena allocation is not fairly equivalent to our deficit to our massive deficit of housing needs as far as like how can, how it can affect uh, rent prices. Um, but you know, what does this all represent? It represents people, as I said, we're planning out for more than a decade and the housing crisis is now. And look, I know this is daunting and every city is gonna have these similar challenges. Every city is gonna have to update their uh, housing elements, rezone for sites, uh, you know, work with their existing specific plans. Uh, but with so many communities in this together, there's going to be tools and resources available. It won't be that bad. Uh, you know, I would ask that we drop the appeal and we work on getting ahead of our current appointment and work in trying to meet our existing goals. The sooner we can get ahead of it and the more focus that we have on that, the better we can serve our community. Um, again, these numbers represent faces, names, families, and stories. And also, I hate to do this. I never do this. But COVID axing the housing crisis, that's a myth. Rents have, may have dropped slightly, but it's still expensive to live here. Fam single family homes remain relatively static in their prices. COVID and the housing demand does not apply to in-person jobs. Rents are still high for essential workers, janitors, auto workers, and people who have to show up in person, which by the way, are disproportionately marginalized communities and communities of color. Thank you, have a good night. You as well. Uh, thank you for your comments. Uh, next, please. Next is Fong Lee. Hello. Can you... Hello. Whenever you're ready. Okay, I'm ready. Um, hi, my name is Fung Lee, and I'm an architect and a resident of San Bruno for the past three years. Um, it's really, really hard to be speaking after Jules and Alex because my points align uh, with them as well on the approach we have regarding the arena numbers. I believe that um, there's no point in doing the appeal because like you said, it's gonna be an uphill battle. If we reduce the numbers for San Bruno, other city will have to make up for that numbers. So, you know, might as well, get ahead of ourselves, get started on allocating the site, studying, analysis, potential parcels, so that we can start working on creating more housing, more affordable housing for all incomes. You know, during my short time here in the Bay Area, um, we've moved five times in six years because we struggled to find affordable housing. And we ended up here in San Bruno, renting a two bedroom apartment with my brother. And we, 
sharing cost by commuting using the BART and the Caltrain. So like you said, you know, San Bruno, there's a, there's a, a lot of need to have more housing in San Bruno because this is a major region transit hub. So you know, I believe we all should come together and proceed with plans to meet the arena numbers as soon as possible. And, you know, even with the COVID that drives everyone, that drives a lot of people out of the Bay Area, what about the people that wanted to stay like us? You know, we yes, there may be a little bit of a rent reduction. We got like 5% reduction, but we already pay like 50% of our income for rent. So yeah, now we're paying like, what, 45% of our income for rent? I mean, it's not, it's not a lot. It doesn't make a big difference, you know? We want to stay here and lead a sustainable life. We don't want to be forced out of the Bay Area like everyone else. So, you know, this is an, this is an opportunity for all of us to come together and encourage more affordable housing for everyone in San Bruno. Um, that's all I have to say. So thank you very much and have a good night. Thank you for your comments. You have a good evening as well. Next speaker, please. Next speaker is Sheila and Bruce. I'm not sure if we'll get Sheila or Bruce, but we'll find out. Uh, hi, this is Sheila. Can you hear me? Yes, whenever you're ready. Okay, well, I think, you know, having um, been someone who moved into California when I was about 40 years old um, with no children, uh, and I was a professional, and we came to Northern California because my husband is from California, and for him, essentially, it was um, coming home, you know, from where we were living out of state. I understand the struggles and the concerns, I think, that I've heard with regard to <clears throat> income levels and housing prices. Um, we too moved here at a time when there was a big dot-com bust. Um, we came from a state where it had been boom town too for years before it went bust. Um, we appreciate very much that we're living on the San Francisco Peninsula um, on the coast in one of the most prized areas across the United States. Um, in a boom town, in a boom area because of dot com and biotech and everything else. So obviously with that comes a high price. Um, and we too struggled. Um, and with two incomes, we were able to slowly move from a rental into a one bedroom, into a two bedroom, into a three bedroom major fixer, um, and then into another three bedroom. Um, and that across 30 years is how we accomplished it. Where we are today is that um, the cost of living of everything has gone up tremendously. Um, we slowly you know, got our foot in the door, worked really long hours and did what we could, but we, again, were not raising a family. So um, those were choices and trade-offs we had to make. Today, when I look at what I've always considered to be high density housing in all of these neighborhoods, which were predominantly built in the 40s and 50s. Um, it's already high density, just in those single family houses. And then when you look at the further high density that comes with these multi-level buildings and the apartments, we lived in a condo association when we moved here that had something like 400 units. I worry about the infrastructure. I worry about the closeness when you consider the pandemics, which will probably continue to come. I worry about people who want the vaccines and there's no supplies. I worry about the empty storefronts. I worry about the infrastructure and how we're going to support this. And then the reliance on public transportation, which again puts you in high density situations, which is not good when you're in a pandemic. So it's a complicated issue. I think we should continue with the appeal. I think we need to continue the appeal. We need to factor in where's the green space? Where are we going to go to exercise? Are we going to have the water? Uh, to be able to, you know, just drink, you know, and keep ourselves alive. There's, there's serious issues here with these numbers. So I would encourage the city not to abandon the appeal and to work, as the first speaker said, in trying to get these regulations and standards realigned for practical, practical situations. Thank you. For your comments. The next speaker, please. Mike Dunham. 
Good evening, Council. My name is Mike Dunham. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, I'm actually a Burlingame resident, but I'm calling in because uh, very much what you guys do in San Bruno affects us and vice versa. What Burlingame does or does not do will very much affect your residents. Uh, so I think it's important we all tackle this housing crisis together. Um, I, like a number of the speakers, I would urge you not to appeal your revised RENA allocation. Uh, whether you all think it's fair or not, the delays in the approval of the Mills Park project really put San Bruno on the radar of state officials and housing experts looking at cities that seem to be intransigent when it comes to building their fair share of housing. Uh, and you know that uh, other cities with that kind of reputation are think places like Huntington Beach that are being sued by the state, uh, Palo Alto, which has been sued by the ACLU for other reasons and is, is very much a target. Uh, I think if you continue to do things like this, like appeal your arena allocation, it just sends a message to Sacramento that San Bruno is not willing to do its parts, uh, which makes more and more likely that our legislators will in turn strip authority from local cities to be able to make their own decisions about development. This RENA process is very much the state's way of saying, okay, we will give you the target and you figure out how to hit it. But if all the message you're sending back to Sacramento always is, no, no, the target's too high, the target's too high, the target's too high, uh, I think you'll see legislators lose their patience for this approach and just say, you know, you know what, we are going to take more drastic action. Uh, so I'd really caution you to be careful about this. The other reason to not appeal is whether your number is 2,000, 3,000, or 6,000, it's merely a down payment on the amount of housing that we need to build here on the peninsula and that, that San Bruno needs to build within your own borders. Uh, we've, this, this crisis we are facing is decades in the, in the making. Um, all of these cities on the peninsula really should be building tens of thousands more units each. Uh, it's just that in this next eight year period, you're being forced to, be, to zone for at least 3,000. Um, I think that in the long run, the difference between 2,000 or 3,000 really doesn't matter. Um, and I would encourage you all and, and to direct your staff to spend time coming up with strategies to actually hit these goals rather than sort of these fruitless appeals that are unlikely to, to work and will just bring, I think, the ire of the, of the state on your back. Uh, I suspect that's not actually what you all truly believe. I think you, you really do want to tackle this crisis. So I would encourage you to uh, drop the appeal and pivot to how can we you know, zone for as much housing as we need to, do it in sustainable, equitable ways. Uh, I think it'd be a much better use of everyone's time. Thank you for your uh, time tonight your comments. Uh, next speaker, please. Aros Tarman. Aros, I'm trying to get you on. Hi, uh, sorry. Uh, this I is actually I... Plymouth Hansburg's using using Aros's account. Okay, whenever you're ready, Plymouth. Okay, great. Um, so uh, thanks, thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, Plymouth Hansburg's a resident of, of San Bruno for coming on almost four years now. Um, uh, I wanted to um, push back on a couple of things that were said regarding this allocation of, of housing and the idea that this is un unfair for San Bruno. I, am, I think it's entirely fair. We have, you know, as um, Javon uh, outlined, pretty much the best transit accessible location on the peninsula. And as such, we should have the most housing to to um, to match up with that. Uh, that one, you know, one of the reasons that we moved to San Bruno was because it is such a good location for transit, um, whether you have a car or fly for work or, um, you know, are, are, are taking public transit. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say was, um, while it is true that people are moving out of California somewhat more than they have in the past, that is not actually reducing the population of California. The population of California is still growing. It's just growing slower than it did before. So we still need a lot of new housing uh, to make up for the deficit of housing that has accumulated over the past uh, several decades. Um, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next speaker, please. Next speaker is Nathan Chan. 
Uh, yes. Hello. Uh, my name is Nathan Chan. I'm a resident of Millbrae, your neighbor's next door. And um, I want to sort of, I, my comments are sort of similar to Mike's insofar as like housing is a, a regional problem and all of our cities need to act in concert together to solve this. And I wanted to draw a parallel with another issue that I care about deeply, which is climate change. One of the most impactful uh, speakers I've listened to on climate change was Paul Hawken, the editor of uh, the book Drawdown. And he had this interesting idea, which is that, you know, one way of thinking about climate change is like, why is this happening to me? Why is all this environmental disaster happening to me? And he sort of flipped, the, flipped it a little bit. He said, why is this climate change happening for me? I think San Bruno should really look at these new Reno numbers as an opportunity. You've heard from previous speakers the cost of, the real human cost of the high housing prices in our area, accelerating homelessness, needing to move all the time, send, paying half your income on rent. This is a real opportunity for San Bruno as a city, its leaders, and leaders across the Bay Area to do something to help people to bring them into quality housing, to give them the security of being able to, to, to live in a place that they can call home. You know, this is kind of like the Paris Accord moment for us. This is the do or die moment. Are we going to bend the emissions curve or not? Are we going to make sure that housing uh, homelessness in California starts to go down rather than increases year over year, forever and ever? Are we going to be able to bring back the California dream for people who at all income level levels, not just those who are paid high incomes in a booming industry. Really, seriously, I think you need to uh, not appeal this renal adaptation. We need to look at this as an opportunity for us to really uh, make a difference, solve a problem that has seemed intractable in California for so long. This is the opportunity bet before you, and I encourage you to seize it. Step up to the challenge. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. I see we have one uh, final speaker, and we'll Yes, Jordan Grimes. Yes, uh, good evening, council members, honorable mayor. Jordan Grimes with Peninsula for Everyone. Um, I was frankly really disappointed to see this item on the agenda. I commented about this at the ABAG hearing itself, um, but the reality is that San Bruno more than deserves this increase in its arena share, uh, <laughs> and then some. Over the last decade, per longitudinal employer household dynamics census data, San Bruno has added more than 4,500 tech jobs, uh, most of which are highly paid positions at YouTube and other technology and professional services firms. In the same time frame, per HUD, building permits for just 217 new homes were issued. Despite claims to the contrary, these numbers make San Bruno one of the worst offenders of jobs to housing ratios in San Mateo County. I also want to vigorously contest the notion made earlier that cities don't build housing. While this is technically true, Cities absolutely set the vast majority of conditions that determine whether or not housing will be built. This isn't just about zoning, but things like parking minimums, permitting timeframes, and the atmosphere of whether or not a city is amenable or friendly to new housing. Certainly, the Mills Park, the Mills Park debacle has materially affected the latter point, and the city will need to find a way to recover from that to attract new housing opportunities in the future. Should you choose to dispute these numbers at AVAG, the city should know that unlike past cycles, local advocates will absolutely provide rebuttals and submit our own opposition. All of the above notwithstanding, rather than engage in housing obstructionism, San Bruno should commit to responsibly doing its part to ensure that those who wish to live in your beautiful city are able to do so. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, and I'm showing no other hands raised, so I'm going to bring it back to council and staff. Uh, any questions? Um, and thank you, council, for allowing us to go uh, to the public first. Uh, Councilmember Mason. Yeah, so I just wanted to ask, uh, the recent um, COVID pandemic has, from what I have seen and read and personally um, uh, am seeing, um, is that there may be a slowdown in financing of some of these affordable housing projects. And so um, I appreciate all the calls that came in tonight. Um, my, my concern 
is setting a goal that just is practically not possible. And so um, I wanted to ask city manager Grogan if on your city manager calls or um, Mayor Medina, if on the regional, um, the regional committees that you're on, if this fear has been expressed around the actual financing of these affordable housing projects. Council Member Mason, uh, why don't I take that? Again, Javon Brogan, City Manager, uh, with regard to affordable housing and other housing uh, projects for that matter, you're absolutely right. There is a shortage of capital uh, right now and, and deals that essentially were not inked and funded before COVID-19, a lot of those transactions are actually not occurring. Uh, that said, San Bruno has actually been insulated a bit from a depression of interest during COVID-19. In fact, we have seen a sustained interest in San Bruno, both on the commercial and the residential side, largely related to the fact that we have upzoned for more housing along our transit corridor, provided that foundational zoning and regulations, the council and the public will remember that we recently adjusted our parking standards and because we're at the center of a lot of transit networks. And so um, a lot of developers are coming into City Hall. They're talking uh, to, to the city staff about sites that they're looking at, and they are certainly viewing COVID-19 as something that is impacting their ability to get capital today, but they're looking at the long-term horizon, knowing that both the housing market and commercial occupancies will come back. And what we're seeing locally with a number of our core property, commercial property owners, is that their plans to develop have not been sidetracked because by the time those projects are entitled, built and constructed, the going plan is, or thinking is that we will be out of COVID-19 just, just by the simple nature of how long it takes to entitle and then 24 months to build given that we currently have light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and there's sort of more and, and more that we can talk about it as, as the night goes on. Council Member Mason, you're muted. Great. Apologies. Um, I heard a number of public um, speakers tonight that weren't from San Bruno. I do wish more residents had called in so we have a better idea of, um, of you know, where the community is, because I think they're all over the, the spectrum right now. Um, but I wanted to bring up that a number of the callers were not from San Bruno, were from cities that were wealthier um, and had, I would say, a more stable budget. And the reason I bring that up is because we have a planning department whom we're going to be hiring for planners. We've recently had three individuals leave the department. Um, welcome to Pam, who just became the director. Um, but I think that is a, a very real practical situation and it takes time to build up a department. And so I wanted to hear from the city manager and I'm sorry, uh, Mayor Medina didn't answer the last question either about the regional boards because I am curious to hear what other city councils are, are experiencing. But I also want to just bring up that my other concern is that we haven't, it doesn't appear that we have had sufficient staffing to move the day to day house renovations that we have right now during COVID. And so um, what is the city planning to do or what can we do or how can the council support the city manager to uh, get a strong planning department that is well staffed to pursue this number if we end up with this, this very high number? City manager, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, let me take that an th that question, and they're they're really s sort of two answers to the staffing question in the community and economic development department, and one relates to current planning, and the other relates to advanced planning. Advanced planning is updating our codes, regulations, and long-term visioning plans. Current planning is making sure that we have enough planners, but also inspectors to do the work on the projects and permits that walk in the door. 
And so as the, the council and, and the public knows is that we have beefed up our staff now with both coming to the, to the city council for additional personnel, but also during this period added additional consultants, both on the advanced planning and current planning side. And so because we are talking about a ABAG planning requirement or that's coming down from the state of California, we will also have to adjust our advanced planning staff, likely with contractors to update our plans to meet the, the, the new arena allocation, whether it stays at the roughly 3,000 or goes back to 2,000. That's advanced planning. On the current planning side, we are supplementing our staff with contractors. The good part about that is that the permit fees cover the full rate plus our, our overhead. We are absolutely analyzing our staffing to determine do we need additional staff full-time planners? Um, and there's sort of the balance there where you want to staff to your, what you need on a regular day or on a regular year and flex with contractors. Right now we're flexing certainly with contractors, but we may need additional staff and we are currently doing that analysis. Yeah. And then just um, to the mayor or even any other council members that have been to regional on regional boards uh, or committees or what are you hearing from other cities uh, without you don't have to name the, the cities, but what are you hearing about their arena requirements? Well, I mean, some of us here serve on heart, which is uh, working together, right? I'm not on that one or a bag and I'm not on that. But uh, uh, some of those some of the regional ones that I'm on, it's about commute or transportation, not specifically that we're talking about reading numbers that, that the ones that I serve at. You're just talking about general conversations and that's different, but we all serve on regional boards. I can say uh, from CCAG, um, we, we had the arena presentation at one of the prior CCAG meetings and I didn't hear anybody who was happy about <laughs> the numbers that they were getting handed. And, and, and I, I, I have to agree, I mean, I, you know, it's listening to the speakers. I have to say that everybody is right, whether they're, they're pro or against, everybody's right. And everybody brings some really valid points to the conversation. But at the end of the day, I, I don't think it's a simple, it, it's not as simple as saying, yeah, let's just take it all on. And I, I, um, it was interesting actually to hear uh, what from the other council members in other cities you know, their, their reasons for, um, you know, not, not agreeing with the numbers. And, and I think the biggest, uh, biggest impact to us is that we had a number that we were saying, okay, it's, it's a hard target. It's a difficult target to meet, but, um, we can probably do it. And then having that whole formula change again, and then having that number increase by, by 50%. And, uh, you know, in some of the speakers brought up some really interesting points uh, about us, uh, you know, contributing to the problem. And that, that is, you know, it's, it's also something that we should consider, but it doesn't necessarily make it easier for us to accommodate um, additional growth. So um, it's a tough one. It's definitely a tough one. Uh, I, you know, I agree. We need to add more housing, but um, even adding more housing isn't going to fix the the income disparity that we have in the Bay Area, and it, it's getting worse and worse. And adding all of those high tech jobs makes that situation worse and worse. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we have uh, currently zoning for a thousand a thousand more units, uh, but nobody's building them. So, um, you know, it's it's not like we're holding up uh, anything right now. We we could you know probably zone for more. Uh, but then there's other other impacts. I remember the first project that we approved down um, at the end of San Mateo Avenue. Um, we took some bold steps with that one and made some concessions on parking. And um, that, that was a, a hard one to sell to the public. And we're seeing the impact. We saw the impact when it was near capacity of, of how not having that parking um, you know, made, made a difference. We weren't able to ever lease out the retail space because there was no parking. And so there's real consequences to doing that. And uh, it's empty now, yeah, I mean, there, <laughs> there's nobody in it. Um, so that also speaks to the people that are saying, you know, what, what are we, why are we building more when nobody's taking these units? Um, and, you know, there, there's, um, 
you know, it seems to be a lot of market rate units. Uh, there's definitely not enough below market rate units. Uh, but, you know, even when we start zoning more, there's no guarantee that uh, anyone's going to want to build those. Uh, so it's, it's been a problem that we've been dealing with for a long time. And it's not from, from a lack of trying. I, I know that we've been, we've been trying to address these issues for a long time. And so, um, you know, I, I appreciate staff's efforts on, you know, trying to make sure that uh, whatever we, we commit to is attainable, uh, realistic and keeps all of the, the real constraints that we have to work with. Um, and we're, we're, we're built out and we're, uh, every, every change that we make is gonna impact somebody. And I think Mills Park was very uh, illustrative of, of how, um, you know, how something like this can divide a community if, um, you know, if it's not done right. And we definitely need to think about all of the impacts uh, when, um, you know, should we choose to go down the path of just accepting a larger number. I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's that simple. And then just to add, I mean, I think even looking at the map that uh, went to the executive uh, board that I saw, it, you know, is it accurate? And I'm not, you know, obviously not everything's 100 percent. But, you know, if they're saying, yes, over here at Tamperan, this is where because you're you're golden near the transportation. But at the same time, we don't own it. Um, and nobody's coming in to say, let's build it. And I think what we also hear, as, as we are from our community, is, well, housing's great, but it's not affordable. So you can say, and, I, and I, I've heard that criticism, is like, you can bring in 100 units, but I can't afford them, or others can't afford to remain here. So really, how does that, how does that help us as a community? But, you know, other, other communities have been having growth and trying to work diligently on that. Not any... Not everybody off offline loves the arena numbers. I just found that ours were more excessive. And, and yes, there's some commentary saying, hey, you guys need to, you, you need to catch up and you need to do your part like the rest of the county. But at the same time, I just want to make sure with whatever that number is, that it was assessed correctly and the documents are, are true and accurate to what it represents. Other, um, oh, um, and, and then, um, I'm sorry, if I, before, uh, city manager, real quick, you know, just about the developing of, of downtown and us trying to do all of that, where are we at with that as far as uh, what, what looks ahead for the future? And Sure, uh, Mayor. As the council and the community knows, we had the Aperture Project on the southern end of downtown uh, uh, recently completed. And there's another project at 111 San Bruno on the northern end that is under uh, review for their building permit. When that's done, that will book in our downtown with two new uh, housing projects. The city <laughs> has been and will continue to meet with developers and pound the pavement to have more development downtown. One of the challenges, even though we have provided the foundational zoning and actually provided additional um, value to the properties by increasing the zoning, is that they're small parcels. And so it really takes a developer with a big checkbook and a long vision because they have to do property assemblage. And they have to go to individual owners in order to get enough pieces of the pie to develop a large multi-unit building. And so uh, we do have a number of developers that have expressed interest of wanting to build multi-units downtown, and it's a process. Um, uh, the city has, in many ways, done its part with the transit corridors plan, but it's not something that's going to happen overnight. Uh, and we talked about the economic development um, manager position to be in a, a position that we can add that will, on a day-to-day, -day be primarily focused on hitting the pavement, supporting our businesses, and incentivizing development. And so that uh, is, is one position that we'll be looking at. But, but absolutely, uh, we're working at it, but it, 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 takes a, it takes a development partner that's willing to maybe buy a parcel and keep working on that other parcel because the property owner is not ready to sell or it has a lease that's not gonna, that's not gonna expire for another five years. And so it, it's a tough process. And th thanks. I'm sorry, everybody. J j just, I just had what's on my mind. Uh, uh, Vice Mayor uh, Medina, say your hand up. 
Yes, thank you, Mayor Medina. Um, so, this council has approved every development project, eventually, every single one that's come to us. And we do not build housing. We have put things in place to, to, for housing to be built here. Um, prior councils approved the uh, transit corridor plan that allowed another 1,610 units. Um, we're still waiting. Um, we're, we're, I believe San Bruno is in favor, favor of building affordable housing. It's, it's just that it should be more fair of the numbers. And, and what's unique about San Bruno then, most of the other cities that these uh, speakers have been talking about, we're in direct path of, a, of, an, of the airport. We have height limits. Um, we're, we're on our east side of town is in a flood zone. Where, where are we gonna put all this housing? It took schools to close Carl Sandburg Field, Carl, Carl Sandburg School, Ingvall, which has been sold for more housing, Crestmore, which is for more, more housing, at the college at, at uh, Skyline, they're building more houses. San Bruno doesn't have the space. So my question, my question for our city manager is that we want to have a reasonable number, an achievable number, and it will take additional effort to find where we're going to put this housing because we, we'd have to upzone a large portion of the city, and and we want something that's achievable, and we are willing to do our part. So, what would it take? Um, my question to staff is, what would it take to, to, to approach anywhere near these numbers? What we would, what would have to happen? So, Councilmember Medina, we have not gone through the detailed several month process to analyze where zoning could potentially be changed in order to go from the, the 2000, uh, which we knew to be in December, to now the, uh, we, which we knew in October, to now the 3000 that, that came out in, in December. So that process uh, has not been done. But I, I think what I hear council articulating and what staff said, and I'll just repeat it for members of the, of the public, especially the housing advocates, is that the city of San Bruno is not saying we're against housing at any affordability level. We're actually saying we're for housing. What we're saying is that the final methodology that ABAC used provided an additional thousand units to San Bruno, taking units away from nearly 14 or 16 other cities in the county. And so we know that there are 20 cities in San Mateo County. And that final analysis, 14 cities either stayed at their level or lost units and we gained. Um, and one of the analytical points that was used said that we're a transit rich community and housing should be built in order to lower VMT, vehicle miles traveled. Well, one of the problems with that methodology is if we take on more of the region's housing burden, that means people will live here, but they will still have to travel outside of here to get to where their jobs are. Another way to do it is to actually build the housing where the jobs are and not have communities like us take on more of the region's housing burden to actually have a truly lower vehicle miles traveled communities. And so we're, it's, it's not that we're against housing. Uh, it's unfortunately just that we believe that the methodology that um, added an additional thousand units to San Bruno uh, is incorrect. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, Councilmember Mason. 
Thanks. I think my other concern is that um, I know that there are stigmas around extremely low and very low income housing, um, but we we clear, we don't have it here in San Bruno at all, and that's a, a concern because um, I have I'd have to look at the San Mateo County numbers, but um, a family of four, I'm going to just guess, is probably going to be between like fifty. And $140,000 is what you have to make to qualify here for extremely low and low income uh, housing. And so that's really your working class families now. And so um, I know affordable housing is already uh, the financing, the construction, the time frames are, are long, but I do just want to encourage us to focus as much as we can on the actual uh, extremely low to low income housing because that is definitely a need and many members of our community will fall through the cracks. They will move uh, if we cannot house them. And so um, I don't know, city manager, if there's anything that's being done now to um, encourage those units in developments. Um, maybe we remove the in lieu fee uh, option completely but we've got to do something to make sure that those units are being built for our families. Thank you, Council Member Mason. We are giving uh, preference and working with developers to actually provide the on-site units versus fee out. One of the challenges with, with the very low or the low income units is the amount of subsidy that's required. Um, and a lot of the projects that have came to you recently have been for sale pro projects. And so one of the challenges there is the amount of subsidy that's required for a for sale unit is in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, and when you look at what it costs to construct a unit in the Bay Area, it's not uncommon for there to be an eight to nine hundred thousand dollar subsidy for a single family for for sale, very low unit. And currently our affordable housing trust fund only has a little bit over three million dollars in it, maybe about three point five. And so with, with that level of subsidy, you you begin to, 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 to see that on the for sale side, we have challenges. Now, the good news is that as developments are approved and people pay the city's affordable housing in lieu, fund, in lieu fee, which is separate from the requirement for residential units to actually build housing, but as commercial developments come online and they pay the, our affordable housing in lieu fee, our, our the city's affordable housing fund grows and then we can invest in either affordable rental or affordable sale, but it, but it takes having development to raise that local capital to then inject into the market. Okay, thank you. And I just wanna echo what I think all the council members have said. I don't think the issue is whether we want housing, um, you probably sound like a, a broken record at this point, but I think we just have some very practical restraints and we want to make sure that whatever allotment we get, we can actually achieve. And clearly we haven't met our first allotment and that's with the approval of every single development that has come to this council. So um, thank you. Any other uh, questions or comments on this? Again, it's a study session, so there is no, um, Action required, city manager. If, if you've gotten what you need out of this, I, I see a thumbs up. Okay. 